Um, well, welcome everyone to uh, the research seminar in interreligious relations. Um, I'm really delighted that we've got um, Hina Khalid uh, with us to speak to us today. Uh, Hina uh, is a PhD student in the faculty um, here in the third year, I think, PhD, um, working with uh, um, Hanka uh, Barua. Um, and Hina gave uh, a really amazing thesis society paper last time. I thought it would just be quite interesting to try and reflect on some of the themes of our research um, in, in this seminar. Um, partly because it, it relates to some things I'm very interested in terms of interest in terms of theology and poetry and poetics um, and thinking about that in um, an inter-religious register, which is, I think, all too seldom done. And so I hope that this might be the first of um, several things that you'll see from CIP thinking about um, poetics in, in an inter-religious uh, register. Um, and I'm really glad that Stephen Tucson, um, also a PhD student in faculty um, and a poet, uh, working with Captain Bigstock and um, um, physics, um, I suppose from a Christian theological perspective, but thinking more broadly about poetry, and um, is going to respond to the perfect pairing. Really. So um, I've been looking forward to the seminar for a long time. Thanks for bearing with us. It's scheduled for last, but we had to do it postpone it. I'm glad that it's here uh, to happen. Um, today. Um, we'll go on until um, probably just before four o'clock when sometimes the New, New Testament studies seminar can be able to kick us out. Um, but I hope that we might then be able to have uh, some tea downstairs uh, together in the in the southern room. Um, so yes. So uh, uh, Hina's paper is entitled, you changed the title actually didn't you? So yeah. I'll read it from here. Um, Cosmic Circuitries of Relationality, the Imperative of Imitatio Dei in the Thought of Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, and Tagore. Uh, so thinking about um, comparative relations poetically, metaphysically, um, between uh, an Islamic, uh, Islamic poet uh, and philosopher and um, from the Hindu tradition. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so <coughs> quick disclaimer as to why I changed the title. Um, because rereading the paper, I realized that I didn't really mention compassion, so it didn't seem fair to have that as the mm -hmm. key word. But relationality is, I hope, a key theme conveyed throughout. Um, and um, initially, this paper was going to be on in the thought of Ibn Arabi, who was a Muslim mystic and philosopher, Muhammad Iqbal and Tagore, and compassion is a huge thing in Ibn Arabi. But I realize that it's probably too much to pack in. Um, but Ibn Arabi will feature in the paper um, slightly. Okay, so um, let's begin. Um, the shared patterns of Hindu Muslim devotion that flourished in certain circles of the Mughal Empire have been noted variously by scholars of Hindu worldviews, Islamic spiritualities, and vernacular styles of South Asian piety. Given that these pre-modern patterns are routinely valorized in contemporary Indian contexts for having created modes of, quote, Hindu-Muslim unity, the relative lack of academic research on the specific theological themes that were shared, though not always without contestation, is somewhat surprising. Instead, the types of sociality generated by forms of Hindu and Muslim devotion are often invoked as a panacea for political problems without, however, offering a nuanced understanding of the symbolic registers through which theologians and philosophers from within two highly distinctive religious worldviews were able to sensitively discern, hear, and cultivate certain resonating vocabularies. In this paper, I want to address this scholarly lacuna by bringing two significant religious thinkers into a creative dialogue, the great Islamic modernist Muhammad Iqbal and the, the literary lodestar of Bengal, Rabindranath Tagore. I argue that both Iqbal and Tagore, drawing on their distinctive religious inheritances, set forth the relation between the finite and the infinite as non-contrastive wherein the infinite stands not as a reifiable item in a cosmic inventory, but as the ever creative and sustaining ground of all that there is. I will highlight their distinctive way of articulating two poles of the paradox. The infinite encircles the finite and the finite recapitulates the infinite. I then discuss some of the implications of their cosmologies for their visions of human becoming, an undertaking that is for both figures firmly rooted in and dynamically oriented to the boundless divine reality. Indeed, for both poet thinkers to be creatively human or humanly creative is to participate in 
as well as reflect aspects of God's own creative life. This human creativity finds its fulfillment in a form of activity which is rooted not in one's individual desires, but is harmoniously transparent to and reflective of the divine will. Such a mode of existential openness is instantiated for Iqbal by the person of the divine vicegerent and is embodied for Tagore in the individual who attunes herself to the unfolding cosmic rhythms by continually offering up her actions for God. So to begin then with Iqbal, in one of his best known Urdu poems, Masjid e Kurtaba, Mosque of Cordoba, Iqbal vividly portrays the world's passage through time as a pointer to the eternal divine reality. Affirming that the temporal succession of day and night is the silken thread with which the divine weaves the cloak of its attributes, Iqbal imagines the world as the unfurling matrix of God's creative power. Indeed, the alternation of day and night is referred to in the Quran as one of the signs of God and is colorfully presented by Iqbal as the lament of eternity's own musical instrument. Through this creative cry, the divine reality sounds its hidden possibilities. As we begin to explore Iqbal's philosophical elaborations of the God-world relation, it is instructive to set this poem against the cosmological scheme of Ibn Arabi, Muslim mystic and philosopher, um, both because of the Andalusian ambiance in which Iqbal's poem found its genesis, and because of its depiction of divine creativity in terms that echo Ibn Arabi. The cosmos is envisioned by Ibn Arabi as the dynamic interplay of the divine names or qualities, which prior to their concretization as individual beings long for existence so that they might display their particular qualities. Ibn Arabi frequently refers to the Hadith Qudsi, which means um, a saying that's uttered directly by God and transmitted through the Prophet. Um, the saying goes, quote, I was a hidden, so this is God speaking, I was a hidden treasure and I yearned to be known. So I created the world in order that I might be known. Ibn Arabi refers to this hadith as an articulation of God's primordial longing to disclose God's various qualities. God gazes upon the names in their distress and it exhales his all merciful breath in and through which the divine names become manifested. Although God's self disclosures are thus refracted through diverse created forms, these are never separated from their ontological ground, i.e. the divine essence on whom their reality remains at all moments dependent. In respect of the single divine breath that enlivens them, these varying disclosive names of God are, quote, he, i.e. God, yet inasmuch as these multiple names have their own contingent realities, they are, quote, not he, not God. In Ibn Arabi's playfully paradoxical idiom, the cosmos is thus constituted as, quote, both he, not he both God and not God. Crucially for Ibn Arabi, God's creation does not refer to an isolated event frozen in the distant past. Rather, God continuously breathes the world into being, revealing God's self in ever new forms. As Ibn Arabi's maxim that, quote, self-disclosure never repeats itself highlights, the cosmos pulsates at each moment with the divine inhalations or the removal of a form and the divine exhalations, the appearance of a new form. And this ceaseless pulsation is also understood as the eternally unfolding dynamic of fana, which is a Sufi term meaning annihilation, and baka, which is a Sufi term meaning subsistence. The words or signs that constitute the cosmos or the names differentially express the divine reality to whom they refer. In other words, each creature displays the divine perfections in varying modalities and intensities. It is in the human being alone that these discrete and partially disclosed divine attributes are enfolded in an integrative unity. 
the human person, in other words, is the most perfect self-manifestation of the divine and stands as a microcosm in the universe. So this brief foray into Ibn Arabi's cosmology is not intended to suggest a wholesale assimilation of his thought into Iqbal's philosophical scheme, but rather as a setting forth of certain key concepts which also permeate Iqbal's thought, namely the ongoing divine creativity, the finite world as enfolded in the infinite, and the human person as the microcosmic telos of creation. Thus, for instance, the word mumkina, which we saw in um, Iqbal's poem, often refers in Islamic cosmological schemes to the, quote, possible things, i.e. those things which have no self-existence, but are, in Ibn Arabi's idiom, exhaled into being by the divine breath. Iqbal's poetic image of the lament of eternity may also be understood against the backdrop of Ibn Arabi's notion that the divine names experience distress in their unentified state, and the creative act is the relieving of this divine tension. Mm. Alluding to the hadith of the hidden treasure with which Ibn Arabi articulates God's longing to be known, Iqbal elsewhere refers to the breast of God as writhing in the pain of solitude and the creation of the world as a satisfaction of this metaphysical yearning. So such inheritances from classical Islamic theology are incorporated by Iqbal into his key philosophical work, the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, which skillfully interweaves the threads of Quranic imagery, Western thought, and the discoveries of contemporary science. By drawing on these multiple resources, Iqbal elaborates his conception of the universe as the dynamic self-disclosure of God, in which all finite entities variously embody the divine plenitude. Iqbal develops the Quranic description of the divine reality as, quote, peerless and unique, to set forth an account of God as the, quote, great I am, in whom the perfection of individuality is transcendentally complete. God alone is the true self or individual, in the sense that God alone is non-dividual, i.e. not internally fissured or subject to divisibility. Inasmuch as the universe is the, quote, self-revelation of the great I am of God, all things manifest individuality to the degree to which they can utter their own I am. Each thing in the universe is, in other words, a distinct kudi or self. Um, kudi is a, a Persian and Urdu term meaning self. Um, so that the universe is a great chain of khudi, of selves. Just as God yearned to reveal God's self in and through the world, every existent, every creature too, longs to unfold its inner potential with the quote, zoke namud, a Persian phrase meaning the delight of self-manifestation, which permeates creative reality. Recalling Ibn Arabi's notion of the longing for identification that characterizes the divine names, Iqbal poeticizes the first day of creation on which all entities declared in mutual joy, quote, I am one thing, you are another. In truth, however, this creative process is not tethered to a first day. Thus, Iqbal speaks of the universe as dynamically unfinished, for the divine creative called B, or Kun in Arabic, still courses through its fibers. Echoing Ibn Arabi's imagery of the divine breath, which endows all finite forms with existence, Iqbal asserts that life is not a mere repetition of the breath, but at each moment flows anew from the eternally active God. This conception of the divine is enfolded for Iqbal in Surah 55, verse 29, which articulates the quote, infinite reality who every moment appears in a new glory. Fleshing out this Islamic idea of a dynamic universe, Iqbal writes, quote, nothing is more alien to the Quranic outlook than the idea that the universe is the temple working out of a preconceived plan. It is a growing universe and not an already completed product which left the hand of its maker ages ago, 
and is now lying stretched in space as a dead mass of matter to which time does nothing and consequently is nothing. Crucially, however, this dynamically incomplete character of the universe does not negate the reality of cosmic purpose and harmony. Each entity or each hoodie or self is directed towards its distinctive telos. And for Iqbal, this directionality is the essence of the Quranic notion of takdir, sometimes translated as destiny. Citing the Quranic verse, which affirms that, quote, God, creates all God created all things and assigned to each its destiny, Iqbal reads this destiny or this takdir not as an, quote, unrelenting fate determining the trajectories of creatures, but as their, quote, inward reach to freely actualize their latent possibilities. The world thus enjoys a mode of true otherness and freedom. And this is no diminution of the divine omnipotence, but is paradoxically an implication of it. In granting being to the world, Iqbal writes, God freely chooses to share God's life, power, and freedom with creatures, <clears throat> which means that finite life possesses a measure of ontological integrity. Iqbal refers to this impartation of identity to the finite as God's voluntary binding of himself to creation, a binding that is born of God's boundless freedom. Iqbal further underscores this entanglement of the finite and the infinite by highlighting that although the world is not equal to God, it is neither straightforwardly separable from God which means that the divine world relation cannot be understood in terms of the relation of two spatially disjointed entities. To treat the universe as a, quote, confronting other, which exists per se, is to characterize God and the universe as two distinctly innumerable things, which stand over and against each other in the, quote, empty receptacle of an infinite space. In truth, however, God's non-finitude or God's infinity is to be understood not as a mathematical infinity in the sense of addition, God as more and occupying the same ontological frame as the finite, but rather as a metaphysical infinity. God does not efface, but encompasses and enlivens the finite in a non-competitive relation. As Iqbal writes, the infinite does not exclude the finite, it embraces the finite without effacing its finitude. Thus, even as the world remains distinct from God, it is never isolated from him. Indeed, creation is paradoxically distinct from God only because it participates in God's own creative life and freedom. In the words of the Muslim scholar Fazlur Rahman, quote, God is that dimension that makes other dimensions possible, end quote. This notion that the infinite is not a reified entity over and above the finite also underpins um, Iqbal's conception of life's evolutionary trajectory. Iqbal highlights that the vision of Islam does not, dis does not separate the material from the spiritual, or what he alternately calls the real from the ideal. Both illuminate and attest to each other Thus, quote, the mysterious touch of the ideal animates and sustains the real, and through it, the real, alone can we discover and affirm the ideal. This cosmic synergy of the spiritual and the material is perhaps best illustrated in Iqbal's defense of the form of emergent evolution in accounting for the development of life from non-life. When matter, for Iqbal reaches a certain degree of complexity and coordination, a higher order self emerges, which is irreducible to the properties of its constituent parts. In the emergence of life or mind, which attains to its fulfillment in the human being, the world realizes a new revelatory depth as the infinite reality discloses something of its ultimate nature as a living self. 
Crucially, however, even as life is not reducible to its physical matrix, this does not mean that God had to arbitrarily impregnate a dead material world with a reality essentially alien to it. To suppose that the finite world of matter was fundamentally incapable of, quote, evolving the creative synthesis we call life and mind, and to assume that the world required the intervention of God only at a certain point in its history, is to regard God's creative activity as episodic, rather than as the ontological foundation sustaining the world at all moments. Therefore, for Iqbal, the capability of matter to attain higher levels of complexity should be seen as part of the imminent creative activity of God and attests to the ontological integrity of the finite world, which requires no sporadic intrusion of the infinite, for all finitude is always already infused with divine presence. In this way, life or mind has emerged organically from the material world and has continued to evolve until attaining its fullest unfoldment in the human being. Iqbal cites the evolutionist perspectives of the Muslim philosopher Jahiz and the Ikhwan al Safa, the brethren of purity, who set forth an early account of the change of life forms through time. Iqbal also cites the poetic words of Rumi which assert that the current evolutionary juncture of humanity is not the final word and presents the various, the, the previous stages through which humanity has traversed as microcosmically enfolded in the human person. So Rumi writes rather beautifully, um, first man appeared in the class of inorganic things. Next, he passed therefrom into that of plants. For years, he lived as one of the plants remembering nothing of his inorganic state. And when he passed from the vegetative to the animal state, he had no remembrance of his state as a plant, except the inclination he felt to the world of plants, especially at the time of spring and sweet flowers, like the inclination of infants towards their mothers, which know not the cause of their inclination to the breast. Again, the great creator, as we know, drew man out of the animal into the human state. Sketching this evolutionary vision in a poetic idiom, Iqbal notes that what is perfectly awake in humans yet rests in the deep sleep in trees, flowers, animals, stones, and stars. That every creature manifests its specific irreducible form of self or kudi invests all creative forms with a distinctive worth. Indeed, one aspect of the God-world relation that Iqbal discerns in the Quran is an affirmation of all created beings as disclosive of the divine. The Quran even sees the humble bee as a, quote, recipient of divine inspiration. So to summarize our discussion so far, through the gradations of evolving selfhood, the entire created world differentially reflects its divine ground. In this ongoing cosmic narrative, it is in the human person, ever unfolded by the divine, that this progressive continuum attains its true fulfillment. The human being therefore stands for Iqbal as the co-creator with, or the associate of, God, and most fully shares in the divine creativity by contributing to, perfecting, and imagining anew the world's forms and possibilities. Iqbal anchors his conception of the unique creative power of the human being to some crucial Quranic motifs, most centrally the elaboration of the human being and the vicegerent of God, and the granting of the divine trust or amana to human beings alone. Setting forth, therefore, a collaborative relation between the divine and the human forms of making, Iqbal addresses God in this way, quote, you created night and I made the lamp. You created clay and I made the cup. You created deserts and mountains and forests. I created orchards, gardens, and groves. Crucially, this conferment of the divine trust and granting of divine vicegerency for the human is not to be seen as instituting a crude disjunction of the human person 
from her surrounding world, or as a cosmic license to subjugate the rest of creation. Such an understanding of vicegerency would misconstrue the nature of God's own creative power, which as, as noted earlier, does not tyrannically subsume, but affirmatively sustains the created integrity of things. Thus, Iqbal asserts that the trust which endows the human person with her unique freedom and creative capacities is fulfilled not by, quote, an unrighteous desire for domination, but by, quote, the nobler interest of a free upward movement of spiritual life, end quote. In this sense, the trust is a calling the human being must respond to and a divine bestowal by which the human person morally aligns herself with the divine purposes. If the human person thus represents the meaning, the telos towards whom creation strains, along life's onward evolutionary trajectory, the divine vicegerent becomes in turn the telos of humankind. He is, he or she is, quote, the goal of humanity. His kingdom is the kingdom of God on earth. Iqbal's conception of this realized individual draws upon the Sufi notion of the perfect human being, or the insan al-kamil in Arabic, um, as elaborated by thinkers such as Abdul Karim al-Hili. In keeping with the classical Islamic formulations of the perfect human, the archetype of this individual is for Iqbal the prophet Muhammad himself. Indeed, it is quintessentially the prophet who stands as the final cause or the goal of creation, as articulated in the Hadith Qudsi, wherein God says to Muhammad, quote, if you, Muhammad, were not, i.e. if you did not exist, I would not have created the universe. Reflecting this Hadith, Iqbal notes that the divine vicegerent who perfectly emulates the prophetic exemplar also participates in this utterance and thus becomes similarly the goal towards whom creation moves. In his Persian work, um, Asrar al Secrets of the Self, Iqbal elaborates the nature of this perfected individual, setting forth three stages of self-realization. The first stage is obedience, wherein one diligently observes the dictates of the divine law and meticulously fulfills one world, one's worldly and religious duties. The, the second stage is self-control, wherein one is firmly in command of one's temptation, temptations to worldly goods. The third stage is divine vicegerency, wherein one infuses the created order with new purpose and vitality. Much as God ever longs to reveal himself, the nature of the vicegerent yearns for manifestation for it abounds with creative possibilities. The divine vicegerent will, in the manner of the prophet, bring another world into being. The vicegerent thus stands for Iqbal as a luminous witness to the divine. In both speech and action, the individual who realizes the divine trust is the very proof of God. So this figure, the divine vicegerent, moves through the world with a dry, dynamic transparency to God. And this mode of attunement to the divine is highlighted in Iqbal's notion that the creative collaborator with God is the one who has wholly submitted their will to God. Thus, Iqbal asserts that it is only when the person of faith becomes annihilated in the will of God that they become the very decree of God perfectly unfolding the divine purposes in the world. Iqbal elsewhere draws on the beautiful Quranic phrase, the quote, color of God, the color of Allah, exhorting us to imbue our hearts with the divine hue and to grant love, ishq, its rightful glory. The person of faith who's become suffused with love loses their will in the will of God and their creative activity in the world becomes a testament to the divine. This individual moors themselves in the habitation of the infinite and their various activities in the world, even their eating, drinking and sleeping, Iqbal says, are stably rooted in the foundation of God. Okay, 
Um, so having uh, explored Iqbal's metaphysical landscape and introduced the perfected human locus of this creativity, for example, uh, we now turn to Tabor's elaboration of the divine world relationship. In developing this distinctive cosmology, Tagore creatively interweaves a range of pre-modern Hindu scriptural notions and, and theological, um, sorry, Hindu scriptural idioms and uh, theological notions. These multiple inheritances flow through Tagore's metaphysical vision and are varyingly foregrounded across his prose writings and his songs. At the heart of Tagore's cosmology is the notion that the world is melodiously sung into being, where this generative sonic impulse is not a one-time burst of divine activity, but pulsates through the cosmos in ever new forms. In Tagore's worldview, this cosmic potency of sound is crystallized in the sacred syllable Om, which is, which is understood within some Hindu cosmologies as the primordial divine enunciation. The meaning of Om, Tagore tells us, is God's cosmic yes to the world, by which God utters and sustains all things in being. As the divine call, it is the all-embracing utterance which sustains the whole cosmos. Um, and this is because the divine caller encompasses all seemingly opposed realities within his being. Reflecting some paradox-laden verses from an important Hindu uh, philosophical text, Tagore writes that God moves and yet is still. He is distant and yet near. He is within, yet also without. Thus, quote, he does not leave out anyone. That is why he is verily all. Thus, in characterizing the divine with the Upanishadic formulation of Santam, Shivam, Advaitam, peace, bliss, and non-duality, Tagore notes that God's peace does not imply an utter lack of motion. Instead, stillness and movement are harmoniously entwined in God. Similarly, God's non-duality does not efface all distinctions, but indeed synthesizes oneness and difference. All individual beings find their transcendental unity in God. This vision of a world infused with and flowing from sacred sound is most vividly elaborated in Tagore's poetic images of the world as the song or the music of the divine being. The world is woven on the warp and weft of a stream of notes, each of which reveals the sacred homology, or to use Tagore's characteristic idiom, the cosmic harmony of the finite and the infinite. Unlike other forms of art in which the final artwork takes on an independent existence, once a painting, for instance, is completed, the painter's loving strokes are withdrawn. The streams of song that burst forth from the singer are never separable from their creative origin. This world song is unceasingly renewed with each divine exhalation and at every moment resounds with the divine voice. Thus Tagore says, quote, the universe is not a mere echo reverberating from sky to sky like a homeless wanderer, the echo of an old song sung once for all in the dim beginning of things and then left orphaned. Every moment it comes from the heart of the master, it is breathed in his breath. As for Iqbal, for Tagore too, the music that pours forth from the divine resonates throughout the world with ever fresh tunes. And in this way, the singer perpetually generates new worldly forms. This notion of creation as God's spontaneous song points us to the crucial Hindu notion of Leela, a polyvalent Sanskrit term with meanings such as sport, play, charm, beauty, and others, Leela refers across Hindu scriptural cosmologies to the notion that God is a free artist who produces and sustains the world through a spontaneous overflow of the divine bliss. This divine creativity is not necessitated by any external imperative acting upon God, for this would imply a lack or a need in God that the world somehow fulfills. Tagore's conception of the divine creativity echoes these 
um, theological templates of Leela. Thus, Tubal writes, quote, God's creation has not its source in any necessity. It comes from his fullness of joy. It is his love that creates. Therefore, in creation is his own revelation. I'll reveal my hair. Um, so as a cosmic symphony that God freely sings into the boundless spaces of the universe, creation streams out of and continually manifests the divine abundance. Somewhat paradoxically, Tabor presents this joyful unfolding as God's renunciation or sacrifice of himself in and to the finite. These seemingly opposed idioms of abundance and renunciation find their synthesis in love. Elaborating the nature of God's creative love, or in Bengali Prim, Tagore affirms that the plenitude of love is inseparably entwined with the austerity of sacrifice. Without love, there is no true sacrifice, just as without sacrifice, there is no true love. If one's act of giving away something is impelled by fear or need, that is no sacrifice at all. Only that which we give from the fullness of our love is a true sacrifice. Since God is the essence or true form of love, God is also the eternal sacrificer. Indeed, it is precisely because God is unconstrained by need that God is, quote, continually active and is giving himself to the world. A crucial aspect, aspect of this generative divine love is that God graciously affirms the finite other in its particular otherness. In the Tagorian language, this theme is expressed as God's voluntary binding of God's self to the world. Just as a chess player willingly submits to the rules of the game so that there may be a structured process, so too does God willingly bind God's self to creation so that the cosmic play or leela might unfold in the world. If a chess player were to move the pieces haphazardly, ignoring their distinctive functions and roles, there could be no play. So just as for Iqbal, God voluntarily limits his will by imparting to the finite world a measure of otherness. For Tagore too, God blissfully sustains particular things in their very particularity. So he writes, the power to be a power must act within limits. God's water must be water. His earth can never be other than earth. The law that has made them water and earth is his own law, by which he has separated the play from the player, for therein the joy of the player consists. Um, so this, this sketch of Tagore's understanding of cosmic creativity highlights a crucial paradox that recurs through his sermons and songs. On the one hand, God is the non-dual reality, surpassing all empirical divisions and producing the world with spontaneous delight. But on the other hand, God joyfully accommodates God's self to the finitude of the spatial temporal world. However, this world of finite bounds, this world of finite form, cannot finally circumscribe or contain the boundless. And this non-containment of the infinite is attested for Tagore by the world's alteration through time. The world's temporal passage intimates that there is always more in it to be unfolded. And brimming over with the infinite, the world thus goes on and further the new. So Tagore writes, quote, life is perpetually creative because it contains in itself that surplus which ever overflows its boundaries, restlessly pursuing its adventure of expression in the very forms of self-realization. Crucially, as for Iqbal, for whom the new forms that God utters into being are ever expressive of the divine life, for Tagore too, the world's generative moments of the new are not, quote, blind movements, but are reflective of and directed to the divine life. As the world of finite forms perpetually moves towards the divine, Tagore writes, the lower is continually sacrificing itself to the higher. Over the spring season, the bud thus renounces itself to become the flower. 
and the flower finally gives itself to the fruit. This renunciation um, is insatiated cosmically in the evolutionary process as life engenders new finite forms that progressively approximate to the infinite. In his key philosophical work, The Religion of Man, Tagore vividly sketches this evolutionary paradigm, identifying, quote, a divine principle of unity at the heart of life's progressive unfolding. First to appear on the stage of God Leela was a single cell, which then joined with other cells into a larger unit. This union was effected not through brute aggregation, but through a dynamic interrelationship by which the individual parts coordinated their functions to align with a wider whole. These larger units went on forming more complex bodies through this principle of unification through coordination, so that the evolutionary vector is propelled by, quote, the continual self-surrender of an individual to its whole. Crucially, the surplus that <clears throat> imbues the cosmic stream manifests itself in the evolutionary progression where the world overflows its bounds towards the infinite. It is also instantiated more intimately in each individual thing. Thus, Tagore highlights that things are never simply the sum of their constituent parts, but radiate with an excess or surplus of meaning. The narrative significance of a book, for instance, even as, as it is inseparable from the individual contents of the book's pages, is irreducible to them. Tagore frames this disclosure of meaning or this unfurling of surplus as the meeting of stillness and movement, idea and form, the within and the without, and most revealingly, the infinite and the finite. Thus, to know the narrative in its wholeness is to perceive the stillness that invisibly holds the moving chapters in relation. It is, in other words, to know the hidden idea contained in the visible forms and the silent, the silent within forcing through the audible without and the infinite shimmering in and through the finite. Developing this cosmic surplus which pervades all finite reality, Tagore tells us that to comprehend the finite without the infinite is to take the quote, lamp without its light or the violin without its music, and thus to not know the lamp or the violin at all. The meaning of the lamp is contained not in its material, but in the light that it emanates. And the violin finds its truth not in a silent self-containment, but in the melodies it sends forth. Light emanates from the lamp as an effusive beaming forth. And this illuminative abundance represents the lamp's own mode of renunciation. The lamp offers its oil to be burnt so that it may irradiate its truth. The music of the violin too constitutes a similar kind of outpouring as the individual instrument gives itself to the flowing whole of the melody. Now this cosmic capacity for self-offering which characterizes all life is perfected in the human being. Echoing Iqbal, Tagore affirms that in the unfolding evolutionary process, life assumes a new direction with the appearance of the human person and finds its, quote, meaning in man. Whilst the animal remains mostly tethered to its biological needs, human being has undergone a, quote, second birth. From the constrictive kingdom of necessity, she has been reborn into the expansive world of excess, which has endowed her with a wealth of creative freedom. The human person thus attends to and infuses her world with the more than, the more, more than dimensionality of reality. Even her satisfaction of her physical needs partakes of a certain surplus. We do not, for instance, simply consume what we need in order to live, but we seek to infuse our food with rich tastes and beauty. The human person through this creative surplus most closely reflects the divine being whose creative activity is untethered to the realm of need. 
So Tagore writes, um, quote, the revealment of the infinite in the finite, which is the motive of all creation, is not seen in its perfection in the starry heavens or in the beauty of the flowers. It is in the soul of man. For there, will seeks its manifestation in will. And freedom turns to win its final prize in the freedom of surrender. If the infinite is revealed in the finite as a paradoxical renunciation in abundance, the telos of human surplus is fulfilled not in our individualistic utterances, but in lending our voices to the eternally effused divine symphony. We become God's collaborators, not by setting up our will in opposition to the divine will, but by harmonizing our creative pursuits to divine truth. And in Tagore's worldview, one crucial aspect of this process of harmonization is the offering up of our actions to God. Here, Tagore develops the theme of karma yoga as outlined in the Hindu scriptural text, the Bhagavad Gita, which asserts that our actions do not keep us bound to the realm of samsara, or in Hinduism, the cycle of rebirth, <clears throat> so long as we renounce our attachment to their fruits. We are born into a world shaped by God's own primordial offering, which is why our spiritual telos is to offer our actions to God as a consciously inhabited practice. In other words, we move towards the infinite, not in a retreat from the finite world, but rather a harmonious abiding in that world, which demands that our actions do not self-referentially circumscribe us within our finite selves or our egocentric desires, but open us outwards towards the divine. In a further elaboration of this finite infinite entanglement, Tagore analogizes our movement through the world to the process of tuning the harp. If the harp is to produce sweet melodies, its strings must be properly bound to it. It is only in and through this bondage, the structure, that paradoxically, the strings attain their true freedom, freedom of melody. To loosen the strings from their wooden frames, to detach them from their telos, which they can only realize in remaining tightly tethered to the harp, from this secure bondage, a vast range of notes and tunes can freely stream forth. In a similar way, loosening ourselves from the external world into the quote, nothingness of inaction cannot be called true freedom. The strings of our actions only become an attenuating bondage when they are not harmoniously attuned to the eternal truth. Tagore elaborates the guiding principle of this attuning and not attenuating bondage with these words, quote, whatever works you do, consecrate them to God. This dedication of our worldly actions to God is the, quote, song of the soul, through which it attains its true freedom and bliss, and through which our roots of action through the world thus root us ever more firmly in the infinite. So, if in the beginning is God, in the here and now is the God with telos of the world. From their distinctive scriptural horizons, Iqbal and Tagore envision the cosmos as teeming with the restless yearning of the human individual to become its true self by discerning its rootedness in the divine unity. As wayfaring humans imitate their divine template, they strive to interweave their worldly threads into a tapestry of relational ontology, where to be is to be related. Just as God's primordial being is God's self-sacrificial becoming, our response to the spiritual, our, our response to the spiritual call to be sent to the self becomes the dynamic site of our existential stability within the abode of the infinite. More concisely, it is the destabilized self that seeks stability in the love's diffused milieu of the divine other. So while these resonances between Iqbal and Tagore might seem quite remarkable, and remarkable they indeed are, they reflect some long-range thematic overlaps across the universes of Hindu uh, Pakti or devotion, 
and Islamic for Sawwal or Sufism. To return to the theme with which we started, the study of these universes in a comparative key can generate more interreligious insight than what we may expect at first sight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hina, for just a fascinating paper. It was really wonderful. Um, Steve? Uh, I first want to thank Hina and Giles um, for giving me the opportunity to respond to this um, beautifully evocative paper and uh, just also just so thoughtful for me. I had, I had the pleasure of thinking about this paper for a few months now. Um, and um, I hope my response is helpful. And also, uh, this paper gave me an excuse. Um, to spend a lot of money on the essential Tabor, which um, used to do that. So I spent some very quality afternoons in its depth since. Um, I'm going to first apologize. I'm, I'm on the end of a cold, so my voice might sound a little bit fuzzy, um, but I'll do my best um, to speak clearly. Um, I have built my response around two principal questions that the paper initiated. The first, in the spirit of interfaith dialogue, asks whether we can discern any metaphysical harmonies between Iqbal, Tagore, and certain thinkers in the Christian tradition. The second is closer to my own research obsessions. Hina, you have clearly and brilliantly established how Iqbal's and Tagore's related conceptions of divine creation model a practical ethic of self-decentering that yet preserves the integrity of the human agent in her individuality. I wonder whether we can also discover in their work a normative model for artistic practice. In other words, how might the poet, as a poet, perform her vicegerency? How might her poetic act approximate the divine lila? You initially draw the comparison between Iqbal and Tugor within the context of the God world relation and the problems for thought it introduces, problems familiar to those of us who seek to defend the Christian doctrine of creation ex nihilo from its modern detractors, um, especially those influenced by Heidegger's critique of onto theology. How to affirm the absolute dependence of the world on God's creative gift while preserving cosmic integrity. How to reconcile divine and human freedom. How to understand a divine unity and eternity that is also somehow dynamic and variegated in your map term. Christian thinkers have their own perennial ways of addressing these questions. Catherine Tanner, for instance, has famously argued that the very coherence of Christian doctrinal language depends on the kind of non-contrastive grammar of attribution that you were defending. But you also draw attention to an emphasis in Iqbal that Christian thinkers too rarely avail themselves of. Following Ibn Arabi, Iqbal affirms that the cosmos is unfinished, a claim which he further grounds in the Quranic view that creation cannot be seen as the execution of a preconceived plan, and that the cosmos cannot be seen as a product with which, after completion, the creator has nothing more to do. Iqbal is trying to avoid, it seems to me, what Erwin Panofsky has called a heretic model of creation. Often attributed to Platonism, this model represents the creator as first, contemplating an idea, paradigm, or blueprint, and secondarily imposing this formal determination onto purely susceptible non-being, whether we call this potency, matter, chaos, or nothingness. This model has been criticized for its implicit dualism and for its ideological ramifications. <laughs> On the one hand, God's sovereignty seems basically capricious. The material cosmos is the actualization of an arbitrarily chosen possibility among infinite unrealized others in the mind of God. On the other hand, creation is understood as total intellectual control. There can be no surprises or spontaneous elan within a prefab cosmos. Christian thinkers have struggled to answer this challenge, as frequently their formulations of the doctrine are wedded to a particular understanding of the divine ideas that strongly suggests a logical, if not temporal, interval 
between intellectual conception and creative enactment. Here, for example, is Thomas Aquinas, quote, God is the cause of things through his mind and will, like an artist of works of art. An artist works through an idea conceived in his mind and through love in his will bent on something. In like manner, God the Father wrought the creature through his word, the Son, and through his love, the Holy Ghost. Iqbal, in the passage you cited, suggests that the artisanal model of creation might itself be the problem. He articulates an understanding of creation as purposive without conforming to a, um, a preconceived paradigm. Perhaps we could allay some of these concerns where we just speak instead of God's causal relation to the world in terms of the internal dynamism of organic growth. At the same time, however, your paper affirms enthusiastically an understanding of the God-human relation as grounded in a shared poiesis, making. For Iqbal, this coalesces around an anthropology of vicegerency, of human continuation and elaboration of God's ongoing creative call, kun B. This anthropology is not identically repeated in Tagore's yogic attunement of human agency to freedom granting minute in imitation of the creative play of God that is also the austerity of self binding. As a provocation for future interfaith discourse, I wonder whether we need not abandon the artisanal model of creation after all, but rather collectively abandon the heretic model of artistry, which distorts our conception of the creative act, whether divine or human. To this end, in addition to Iqbal and his Quranic sources, we find an ally in the ninth century Christian Platonist John Scotus Erigena, for whom God does not know things in advance of making them, but only as they are made. Creation on this understanding is itself a form of perception and understanding. Such a model reorients our attention from the factum, the thing made, to the factio, the making, and consequently shifts the direction of our metaphysical questioning. You show that both Iqbal and Tagore affirm human ontological integrity, and the ontological integrity of their own creations, not to the extent that each is a spatio-temporal thing, which more or less conforms to ideal things in the mind of God, but to the extent that each actively harmonizes with the ongoing singing of divine creation. On this note, I am wondering whether we can interpret Iqbal's and Tagore's creation theologies in light of secular transformations in the worlds of art and literature that took place in the early decades of the 20th century. <clears throat> I mean, these are in circles that they were actively moving into. I'm thinking specifically of the emphasis on materials, techniques, and processes that define the modernist movement. The goal of art became less about producing a beautiful object and more about the producing itself obtaining to beauty, to spiritual illumination and higher stages of consciousness. This leads me to the question of how we might characterize the poetics that naturally flows from the complex theological and medical, metaphysical vision of your paper. I would be fascinated to hear your thoughts on this, but I want to highlight two motifs that seem particularly suggestive. First, Iqbal's reconciliation of a bottom-up emergentist evolutionary perspective with a top-down metaphysics of participation offers us a way to overcome another perennial dichotomy that has plagued Western thought, the apparent tension between explanations of artistic creation that emphasize inspiration and those that emphasize technique. Because, as Iqbal attests, God solicits the evolution of progressively more complex matrices of creative intelligence, there is no need for adventitious events of divine interruption or intervention to account for the coalescence of mind and organic life in human beings. Can we not similarly reinterpret inspiration, not as some alien possession or circumvention of technical reason, but as the divine solicitation at the core of our being that draws forth the peculiar cunning of art, the savoir-faire, the know-how, which in a particular sphere of human production, evolves over generations, becoming progressively encoded in the neuromuscular matrix of bodies and in the heritable practices we call techniques. Secondly, 
Tagore's vision of Leela represents creation as a kind of game. God channels his pure joy through self-limiting structures, which paradoxically intensify this joy. Does this encourage a reinvestment in poetic constraints, like elaborate rhyme schemes, complex metrical patterns, and stanzaic forms, just to give a few examples? These might be redeployed against academicist fetishization of the well-wrought urn mm -hmm. and in service of a kind of intentional practice um, a prosody is karma yoga, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is to take these analogies too far, but it was certainly a lot of fun to conjecture about them in relation to your paper. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Mm -hmm. That's um, Hina, do you want to respond directly to any of that? that um, yeah, gosh, so much there. Can I just finish writing this point out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't I can't stop in the So rich, wow. Um yeah, I I I really think those last two points you made, um uh this kind of taking Iqbal into real metaphysics and interpreting them in this really creative way as this kind of opening into a particular vision of what it means to make is really profound, actually. And that's just so helpful. I, yeah, I've not made that connection before, but that's super helpful. Um, and uh, I just don't really have anything to say apart from just great, just amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Um, um, I mean, so Iqbal and Tagore do have, you know, they they dwell on what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a poet. Um, and for Iqbal, um, as you, you know, you, you made this really great connection between the poet as, or, the, or seeing the poet as vicegerent, as the poetry or art making as a particular instantiation of vicegerency. And certainly Iqbal talks about himself as a poet in this way. Um, he sees kind of poetry or the gift of artistic making as a kind of trust, as a kind of duty to which one is faithful. Um, and the ways that he talks, the kind of language in which he, the language through which he talks about the vicegerents is very similar to the language that he, through which he talks about the poet. So this, these idioms of like bringing a new world into being, mm -hmm. um, being God's collaborator, that sort of thing. The language is so, so similar. Mm -hmm. um, and Tagore, yes, Tagore, I mean, yeah, I mean, for him, in a way of anything that we do can be rendered artistic if we do it in the spirit of offering mm. actions to God, which I think you were kind of gesturing towards when you said poesis, like making, just the act of making. Um, and so insofar as something is done in this spirit of self-giving, it is art artistic um, because it echoes the divine art. Yeah, but those are just random thoughts, but that's just so much for me to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.